thank you very much, Tom, for um, the introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today virtually to um, present to you on some of the work that we've been doing in relation to GR6J rainfall runoff modelling in support of water resources planning. So I'm, I'm here today really in my capacity as a project manager for these projects, but I'd like to really acknowledge and thank the wider Mott McDonald team that have uh, contributed to this. Uh, their names are listed on, on the slide there, and it's really thanks to their expertise and inputs that this, this work has been, been possible. So some of you might already be familiar with GR6J and some of you might not have heard of it before. It's, it's a relatively new um, uh, hydrological model for the UK industry. So this is a good opportunity to present to you a little bit about why we chose the model, our experiences in applying it and um, some of the results and, and the performance of the model itself. So just to sort of talk, talk through um, uh, a little bit about what I'm going to talk about. So I'll, I'll give a bit of an introduction uh, and then move on to um, discuss um, a bit about the input data sets that we're including in the model. Um, we did some benchmarking studies on the model and others right at the beginning of the project. I'll talk a bit about that. Um, this builds on a poster we presented at the Innovation in Hydrology conference back in September. Then uh, talk a bit about the wider modeling rollout um, across the various projects and then move on to talk results and model comparisons and then conclusions and um, some thoughts on further development. So just to set the context of the work, um, back in that conference in September, um, Jeff Darch gave a really good presentation about um, better incorporation of drought risk and climate change projections into water resources planning. And um, he, as part of that presentation, he mentioned about the development of rainfall runoff models, which underpin a lot of that work. So this presentation really builds off that, and it's and it's for those drivers of assessing um, historic droughts that often fall outside of the historic records, and also um, stochastic and climate simulations. Um, that's really the key driver for why we're doing this, and it's in support of the Water Resources Management Plan development for 2024 and also for regional planning purposes for the UK water companies. So the work originally started for Anglian Water and Seven Trent Water, and we then went on to develop projects for Northumbrian Water and Essex and Suffolk Water as well. And so I'd like to take the opportunity to thank them all for their support in being able to do this presentation. Now, a key requirement of that work was really to provide scale to the modeling delivery um, through efficiencies to meet the very tight program demands, and also deliver strong model performance. Now, I've also um, we've also started to apply GR6J in some other settings. Um, so, as part of a project for United Utilities, a WINUP investigation, and also in support of SSE's hydropower operations. So, I'd also like to thank them for um, in the incorporation of their information within within this presentation. Though I should say the overall presentation is probably more focused on the, um, the work for the, uh, uh, the water companies uh, for the development of WMP24 and regional planning. So just to talk about the input data sets, um, I won't talk too much about precipitation. Um, there is, uh, as some of you will be aware, there's a, 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 a relatively new gridded data set available from HAD UK which provides um, precipitation on a one kilometer grid that is available for um, uh, across the whole country from 1891 to effectively to, to date, latest release being in 2020. So as part of some of the um, early work, we did some benchmarking of this data set and found that it performed very similarly to other data sets that were in use um, previously. PT is perhaps a little bit more interesting. Um, and um, really, one of the requirements of this work was to provide a um, consistent data set that covered the same time period as the rainfall data. A lot of the data sets that um, are available and have previously been used, such as Morex, Moses, uh, Chess, are available from 1961. I should also say at the time of doing the bulk of this work, the recently released EAPT dataset wasn't available. So we we're very much faced with um, uh, developing a PT dataset ourselves that went, um, uh, that gave that um, temporal coverage. 
So we look to use the HAD UK uh, climatological data sets um, and the raw parameters that can be used to do IPT, so maximum minimum temperature, wind speed and sunshine hours. So from this, we're able to derive a PT data set on a daily basis using the Penman Mob Teeth equation. And this was from 1960. To, to work out a, a PT series prior to that, um, that had daily, uh, daily, uh, daily time step, um, it was a bit more complicated. Uh, the HAD UK data is only available for all the variables as monthly prior to to 1960. So we looked to, you, to supplement it with Midas station data, which provided us with um, daily profiles within each month to allow us to, to basically provide, uh, or to create a data set that was daily from 1891. So we, at the time we did some benchmarking on this data set um, against Chess PE, and we found that um, it delivered slightly improved model performance um, compared to that data set. More recently, we've had a look at how it compares to the EAPT dataset. Um, and broadly, we've, although the EAPT dataset has a uh, different, um, it also uses pen and teeth, but it's, it's more detailed in um, some of the use of parameters. Um, we generally found that the model performance was equivalent between both datasets. And there wasn't really any, uh, any clear differentiation between them in terms of model performance. We did have a look at uh, trends in the data set, and we've compared this against the paper by Robinson at 2017. And we found that for our test catchments, we were getting trends of about sort of 0.7 to one millimeter per year in the Midlands and one mil in the Anglian region. And these compare quite similarly to um, the uh, values that are presented for the uh, region for the English lowlands and the region for England within within that paper. Um, we did we did uh, observe that the EAPT data set had slightly higher trends uh, around 1.2 to 1.4 for the Midlands and 1.7 for the Anglian region. So there might be some scope there for a bit of further, further investigation as to why there are why why there are some of these differences in in the data sets. The other major input to the hydrological models uh, that we were developing is artificial influence data. And a lot of the catchments we were looking at are significantly impacted by surface water and groundwater artificial influences. And I've, I've listed some of those um, there to give you an idea of the sorts of things that we're, we're considering. So in general, we were looking to use um, daily public water supply abstractions and transfer data where that's available. We looked at uh, deriving dry weather flow profiles for sewage treatment works. That's a, in, in some areas a particularly significant contribution to, to flow. And in terms of the other abstractions, we were looking at analysis of the Environment Agency abstraction license returns data. And this was all brought together to derive lumped series um, of surface water and groundwater artificial influence that could be incorporated within the models. And just to talk a bit about the benchmarking studies that we, we undertook. So um, back in 2019, when we started this work, uh, we really had the opportunity to review um, the available lump conceptual models um, for both their performance and efficiency of application. Um, and this work started for Anglian Water and also for Seven Trent Water with some scoping studies where we looked at these different, um, different packages in, uh, in respect of uh, various pilot catchments. Uh, the pilot catchments are shown there on the map. We for Anglian Water, we started with looking at the gouache and the tud, and then moved on to the Welland with a short list of uh, three, three uh, models. And then for Seven Trent, we looked at um, five models in respect of the Derwent catchment. And I think it's really important to say here that we, we had no preconceptions about which model would be adopted. Um, we're very open to adopting um, any of the models, that, that were, uh, any of the seven models that we looked at. Um, some key things about the way we approached it. Um, we very, very much did an equal efforts approach on calibrating and validating each model. We did adopt manual calibration. Um, That's partly because one of the models we were looking at didn't have the ability to automatically calibrate for the performance metrics that we were um, particularly interested in. I'll mention that in a, in a moment. 
And, and, if, and of course, the, the key thing in this was to use consistent model performance criteria to assess their relative performance, as well, of course, using common input data sets for all the models so that the comparisons are fair. So the seven models that we, we looked at um, are listed here, and uh, many of them will be familiar to, to you. Um, uh, the first one, HiSIM, was the pre-existing model for Seven Trent Water, um, and also was a model used by Anglian Water for some of their sources. So it, it was a logical choice to include in the benchmarking study, and it, and it has a, a, a proven track record and is, is widely used. It does have a large number of parameters, um, 10 basic parameters with, with 12 more advanced ones as well. And the code itself, unlike all the other models, is, is not an open code, it's a standalone piece of software. The, the other models, um, so CatchMod, many of you will be familiar with, previously the Thames catchment model, uh, widely used by the Environment Agency and various water companies. Um, in relation to parameters, uh, it has, the model is broken up uh, into hydrological zones. And so there are effectively four parameters, four variable parameters per hydrological zone. So depending how many zones you have, the model itself could have four, eight, 12, and so on parameters, depending on the model complexity. We then looked at a couple of models that are used more widely internationally, um, HBV and NAM. Uh, so they probably have slightly less usage in the UK, um, but are definitely used uh, more, more widely internationally. PDM um, is widely used in the UK, both for flood forecasting purposes and for water resources. So that model was also included. And then lastly, GR4J and GR6J. Now I should credit Jeff Darch for identifying uh, GR4J for inclusion in the studies. Now GR4J is used um, in the About Droughts project and also in the Hydrological Outlook um, UK. Um, I also need to credit my, my colleague David Osio, who uh, was the one who dug a bit further and identified GR6J as a possible option um, as it as it was very much developed to help to overcome some of the shortcomings of GR4J in, in low flow simulation. And I'll uh, talk a little bit more about the differences between the models in a moment. So broadly speaking, just give you an idea of our, our calibration and validation approaches for the modeling. We were looking in the original work to calibrate on the eight most recent water years and then validate on the eight uh, years prior to that. Uh, to see how well the model performs outside of the calibration period. Two-year warm-up periods used just to settle the model and, and deal with any initial conditions. This wasn't set in stone, and uh, there were occasions when we needed to swap periods, perhaps due to um, data quality issues or where we felt that we were getting a better fit to low flows, uh, particularly to low flows by, by calibrating on an alternative period. We also looked at longer term verification on historic droughts, which I'll, I can I'll mention in a moment. So before I just talk about the conclusions of the benchmarking study, just also mention about the statistics we were using. So commonly in the modeling, we, if we were looking at this visually, we'd be very interested in flow duration curve fits, how good the fit is across the full range of flows, as you, as you can see from the, uh, the uh, uh, graph on the right there. We'd also want to look at flow charts to see how uh, how the how the visual fit was to peaks, recessions, um, summer storms, and post summer recovery. So, in in assessing, um, uh, well, we needed to develop and and use appropriate statistics that gave us a balanced view on on model performance. And so, we ended up selecting these four statistics here for use in in the work. So firstly, the volume error, um, which is a, a measure of the overall model water balance, very useful, useful and important tool. The next one, um, which many of you know about the Nash Sutcliffe coefficient, uh, to give us a view on how good the fit was on a daily basis. And then the log Nash Sutcliffe, so that's where the flows are logged before the statistic is calculated. And that one gives us a better view on, or a more balanced view that's weighted well, it's weighted more towards low flows, so it gives us a view on how, how the, um, from water resources perspective, how, how good the fit is towards that end of the, of the curve, I suppose. And then lastly, we came up with a statistic um, that 
we've called log NSC FDC, and it's effectively the log NSC, but calculated on the individual percentiles of the flow duration curve, every 1%. And it's a way of turning that visual look of the flow duration curve into a, a, a statistic that we can measure. So it's a, it's a way of quantifying how good that, that fit was, and, and that statistic was incorporated as well. And, and that's quite an important thing for water resource assessment, because um, you might be able to get good fits on um, on the other statistics, but um, if your flow duration curve is off at the point where you have an abstraction or, or at a critical point, that, that could have a bearing on the, um, on the model performance. So the conclusions of the benchmarking studies, well, we took those um, performance metrics, in this case, the volume area log NSC and the FTC statistic, um, and they were calculated for both calibration and validation periods, and uh, the models were ranked, and then the average rank was, was uh, calculated. And you can see at the bottom uh, right there is a table summarizing the various models and the rankings we've got for the different catchments we were looking at. And as mentioned before, not all the models are applied for all of the catchments. The full seven were applied originally for the um, Gosh and the Tard in the Yankton region. But GR6J very much came out as the strongest performing model in, um, in both, both areas. Um, high SIM, then HB followed, HBV followed in sort of second and third place. And that was a pretty consistent conclusion between both, both um, regions and, and the catchments we were looking at. We found GR6J was probably the weakest performing model out of all of them. But one thing I would say about this, and um, particularly when we come to look at the Derwent results, where we've got uh, PGM and CatchMod um, uh, ranked as a fourth and fifth, um, it's fair to say all the models performed well on the Derwent. And certainly this comparison is there to, to is a relative comparison. And certainly all of those models would be appropriate for adoption. Um, so a lot of the conclusions here come down to, um, okay, there is a performance issue, um, but it is not It is not saying that the other models are not suitable for adoption. Um, but a lot of it comes down to ease of calibration as well. So in those considerations, we found that GR6J and HBV were the easiest to calibrate. Um, and then high sim was definitely more time consuming to calibrate. And this really is because it sits in a standalone, standalone program but it's still a practical option. Um, of all the models, CatchMob was the one that took the most time. And this is really because um, it, it's due to the large number of potential hydrological zones you have that you can build up your model with. So you, you, each time you add a zone, you need to calibrate that one. So it can, it can become quite, um, compared to the other models, a more time consuming process. So based on this, GR6J was, uh, was adopted for wider rollout um, across the various projects. Now, just a little bit on why um, why we see such a difference in performance between GR4J and GR6J in those in those angling uh, catchments. So there are lots of aspects of the model which are common. Um, both have a, a production store representing the soil package, and both uh, have a split in runoff uh, with ten percent going as direct runoff and 90% um, going through the rooted stores. The difference is that GR6J has an additional rooting store and that enables a differentiation effectively between interflow and base flow. Both models have a catchment interchange, which enables water to be gained or lost to neighboring um, uh, catchments. In GR4J, this is one directional. But in GR6J, there is an additional parameter included, which allows that interchange to be reversed below a particular threshold in the routing store. And that, <clears throat> that factor enables more flexibility in the model to be able to fit different, different low flow um, conditions. So just to mention some general principles about the wider modeling rollout, um, the GR6J models um, work when they were, when we look at catchments that were larger and, uh, and further downstream, we were calibrating individual GR6J models and linking them together um, and routing flows using kinematic wave routing. 
So downstream locations were built up um, based on routed flows and then calibration of intermediate catchments uh, downstream. For the rollout, we, were, we moved to using automatic calibration, which I'll mention on the next slide. Um, and we used a bespoke objective function, which combined those four statistics that I was talking about earlier. Most of the models we were looking at were calibrated either against observed flow or naturalized flows. Um, and just a few of them were calibrated uh, on derived reservoir inflows. And, and those ones um, are, are quite heavily impacted by the, uh, all, all the data that goes behind that derivation of that flow series. So slightly, um, we, we do have sort of reduced um, performance in, in those ones. Lastly, I'll, I'll mention a moment about sort of long time, long term verification of uh, historic droughts and uh, development of reservoir simulation models. But just to touch briefly on what we did in terms of automatic model calibration, we adopted the shuffle complex evolution algorithm, um, which is uh, sort of a, a picture of, of, of how it is operating shown there on the right. It uses a mixture of sort of direct search and random methods. Uh, and it's uh, quite a, an efficient way of um, exploring the uh, response surface to find the global optimum um, model solution. And it's more, um, it's more efficient than some of the uh, ran more random sampling methods that can be adopted. So just to give an idea of, of sort of how long this was taking um, and what this enabled us to do. So the model itself for say a 20 year simulation takes about 0.2 seconds to run when, when coded in Python. So it's quite quick. And when it, let's say we're looking at uh, 50,000 model runs to find that global optimum, we're looking at about that taking three hours. So that's significantly cutting down the time um, it takes and, and it can be left running overnight um, to, to do that. So really what this has enabled us to do is rather than spending a long time calibrating each catchment, we can look to test alternative calibration strategies. So we can look to test calibrating different periods of data or against different objective functions. Lastly, just to say, it didn't remove the need for manual calibration. I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that in, in a moment for, for some of the more challenging catchments. So in terms of um, what we were doing in terms of long-term verification of droughts, um, we, we, we were, as I mentioned, we we're tending to focus our statistical assessment on the recent period due to greater confidence in the reference flow data and also uh, because we have better records on artificial influence. However, we did consider the model performance in key drought years, such as 1975-76 or 95-96, um, and uh, this assessment was done more qualitatively through examination of the flow charts and the flow duration curves. Reservoirs offer us actually a really good opportunity to test how well um, the models perform. So for reservoirs, we were looking to develop simulation models that took into account any releases or compensation flow from the reservoir as well as abstractions and transfers and the change in the reservoir storage. So this enabled us to simulate the reservoir drawdown and recovery using the modeled inflow series. And particularly during periods where there isn't any outflow um, and when all the water is being, aside from any compensation flows being stored in the reservoir, it's a really good way of being able to verify the catchment water balance. So there's one particular example that's worth mentioning. Um, so this is Vernery Reservoir, which is a key abstraction for United Utilities and provides regulation on River Seven. So there, there is a naturalized flow series that's available um, for, the, uh, for this site based on the downstream gauge and taking into account reservoir, um, reservoir operations. But we were finding in the model, uh, in, in the work that we couldn't get the uh, volume balance to against the naturalized series to fit with the records on the reservoir drawdown. And what, uh, what came to light was that, um, and, and you can sort of see this in the bottom right with the, um, the uh, this is the rating curve for the site. It's, it's on a log chart and I have to say it's a bit difficult to see exactly what, uh, what we're talking about, but um, 
the main issue is there's a lack of gaugings at higher flows. So there's only one gauging um, up towards the, the top end of the curve. And uh, the theoretical flow is underestimate, underestimated by 19% compared to the highest gauge flow. So there's evidence there that the, the rating for the downstream weir is not quite right. And that means that that, that feeds through into the naturalized series and into our ability to calibrate the model. So the, the table there with the results shows we can, we can get a good fit to the naturalized series, but in reality, we possibly shouldn't be trying to do that because of this issue with the rating. So what we ended up adopting was a, a manual calibration on it, and we were accepting quite a significant volume error on the overall series, and we were matching it instead to the reservoir drawdown data. So that really is, a, is a quite a good example of why that data is really useful and important in these sorts of assessments. The other example I wanted to mention was um, the Ivel at Blunham, which is over in the over in East Anglia, part of the Bedford Ouse catchment. Um, this station itself is historically one of the three stations used to calculate flow offered for extraction at uh, to graph and water. And this station, you see from the picture, is heavily impacted by weed growth issues. Uh, and and it, it appears to be something that uh, has, has an issue that's been getting worse over the last sort of 10 years. Um, so again, the model, automatic calibration uh, was delivering quite good model performance. And you can see from the FTC there, the fit is quite good, except for the very lowest end. Um, and that's where perhaps the, uh, the, um, uh, the difficulties lie with this one. Um, so based on this information, looking at the spot flow gaugings, we did a manual recalibration of the model. Um, and you can see the, the results there on the right. We've accepted quite a significant deviation on the FTC. And effectively, we've had to slightly ignore the statistics and accept deterioration on all of them in order to get a better match on spot flow gaugings. So I think those two examples give a good um, flavor of the sorts of um, sorts of real life issues we're faced with in the modeling and that it's not um, it's not just a case of running automatic calibration accepting results in in these cases that there needs to be that manual uh, manual review and intervention to decide actually uh, are there any issues with the stations that we we really that, that, that might be affecting this assessment that we need to take into account so just to run through overall results and our and observations from the work. So I think in terms of um, what we were setting out to do uh, to create a model or sorry, to, uh, to use a model that um, could be implemented efficiently, I, I think GR6J does perform that function well. And just to give you an idea of the numbers of simulations we were ending up running. So per catchment, we were looking at about, on average, 30,000 scenarios. And I did a quick calculation. That's 1.5 million years of hydrological simulation per catchment. So it's really important then to be able to get a model that runs efficiently and can be used to scale up um, for, that, uh, for that level of work. And, and GR6J does, does do that. The, the automation. Um, uh, it is really important, um, not just on the automatic calibration, but in other aspects of the work in terms of the data processing. But again, that, that manual calibration and review on catchments um, is really important. And, and obviously all, all, all the catchments we were looking, looking at had manual checks on them to make sure we were happy with the model performance. The model um, does apply well outside of its calibration validation ranges. Um, 1976, also for when we've looked at the stochastic and climate change simulations and reviewed those results, um, the results are, are plausible and, and reasonable. Um, though I would say 1976 does present some specific issues that, um, that I think it's fair to say a lot of models have struggled with, and there are still some issues in that particular year um, for some catchments. I, a sort of slight word of warning with GR6J, uh, and that relates around to the model interchange functionality. Um, this does have the potential to impact on uh, the low flow performance and is certainly something that um, needs to be looked out for. And um, keeping the, uh, the ranges of those parameters under control and tightly limited is, is important. Um, there are cases where it's quite reasonable to have a larger interchange function, but 
it's certainly something to be aware of and, and look at. Um, the other thing to say about sort of parameterization, um, we, we tended to find with sites where we had good records, when we did different calibration options, we found that parameters that were being selected tended to converge. Where we had sites with lower um, with lower confidence in the flows, we tended to find much wider range in potential parameters, parameter ranges. So the table there on the map just gives a bit of an idea of the overall statistics we were getting from across all the projects we were doing. I should say the assumptions and periods of calibration are slightly different for some catchments than others. So it's not it's not a uniform um, study, but I still think that the comparison of statistics is useful. We've got NSEs um, above 0.8 um, and log NSEs above 0.87, um, which, which is a great result. 90% um, of the catchments also had NSEs above 0.7. As you can see from the last column of the volume error, the models tend to be slightly uh, conservative in terms of underestimating flows. And a large bit of that is due to um, the, some of these uh, weed growth issues and particularly affecting catchments in, in East Anglia, I'd say. So I made some, uh, just a couple more slides, um, some broad comparisons with other studies. And uh, so the first one is just look at the historic droughts project and, and the results from that. One thing I would say before making this comparison is a lot of caution here. Um, I, we're comparing models that are developed using different input data sets and uh, importantly, different calibration periods. So the results should be taken in that light. Um, but I still think there's some, some useful things to draw from it. I think the, as you can see from the tables below, the difference in statistics is, um, is significant and I think it supports those conclusions we were making at the beginning about selecting uh, GR6J over GR4J. I think also the results are affected by uh, inclusion of artificial influences in, in the GR6J models, which I don't believe are taken into account in the, in the GR4J models. Um, and, and that has enabled improved performance, particularly when you look at um, the Anglian region. So in the uh, historic droughts project you see a drop in the NSE um, between when you look at all the catchments and when you look at the Anglian catchments and there's still a bit of a drop in the work that we've done but not as not as significant so I think that's a, uh, I think that's indicating that that issue there. The other um, study which is a paper from this year and it's under review um, reviews uh, four conceptual models ones we've we've not looked at, but compares them with neural networks um, for a large number of catchments over uh, over 600. Again, the same cautions apply in these model comparisons. And I think really um, what I wanted to show from this was um, when you look at the um, the spread, you've got six, uh, six um, maps of the UK at the bottom. Um, the two on the left show the neural networks and then the four after show the conceptual models. So for the conceptual models, you see um, a drop off in model performance as you head towards the southeast and East Anglia with stronger performance on very much on the west, west of um, the UK. It's quite an interesting, interesting pattern. Um, and in the results we've got there on, on the right from GR6J, you see a, a, perhaps a slight indication of that, but it's, it's, there's not that same sort of um, reduction in performance as you as you go across, and that's borne out by the average statistics, which again aren't directly comparable, but they do give an idea of the relative performance between the two the two regions. So just to just to to finish on some conclusions uh, and, and recommendations, I think um, in in the work we're doing in applied uh, rainfall modeling. Um, I think a lot of the issues revolve around input data and um, confidence with reference flow series, and that's where often the challenges lie. The model choice is important, and um, GR6J has demonstrated strong performance, and it's enabled us to deliver that efficiency and application when running all the stochastic and climate change simulations. Um, automatic calibration is, is a great tool. Um, and uh, it's fantastic, it's really helped us, but I, I don't think it removes the need for, for um, 
manual review. So I think the role for a hydrologist is pretty safe. And um, uh, just a, another thought, I suppose, on this is that um, it, I think there would be benefits to the overall modeling process um, by aligning the model updates more widely with um, gauging station reviews so that all, all that information can feed into the modeling and, um, and be taken account of when that's undertaken. So in terms of further development, we've, we're sort of doing a few more um, uh, modifications to things. We've been looking at an additional performance metric to focus on the very low flows. Um, and also we've been developing a snowmelt routine to add to the model, um, which we're currently testing on some catchments in Scotland. And um, I suppose the other thing is to, I, I perhaps didn't mention at the beginning, we used a 12 kilometer PT data set. So there's options um, and we're looking at moving to a one kilometer data set there for PT, and that will help with the settlement of upland catchments. And then more broadly, I, I think there's room for investigations into um, parameter uncertainty associated with GR6J and also options to consider um, linking the model with real-time information and potential drought forecasting applications as well. So that's everything. I realise I've gone over my time slightly, so apologies about that. Um, quite a lot there to get through, but thank you very much for, um, for your time. Thanks, Son. That was really, really interesting. Um, we've still got a bit of time, actually, because we've technically got to a half past. So I suppose if anyone's got any questions, uh, do you want to stick their hand up or put it in the chat? And then we can, uh, so I don't know if you can pick up the chat as well, um, but we can read. Um, uh, I, not at the moment, but uh, I, I, oh, can, I, can, I can. I can. If I stop sharing, I might be able to. I've got a question though, if, if, uh, if people are still thinking what they want to ask you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, you mentioned at the start that GSXJ um, was easier to calibrate and validate. Um, could you sort of elaborate on that? I suppose more of a comparison to say catch models. Catch model is a, is an easy, quite an easy model to calibrate to, or calibrate with rather. What what's how's the GR6J better in that sense, from a practical sense? Um. So I think in terms of manual calibration, because it's limited to uh, six parameters, um, you've got you've got smaller a smaller um, a choice of parameters to modify. Um, whereas I think with catch model, although each hydrological zone is um, in itself also easy to calibrate, you have, uh, you have a decision to make at the beginning about how many hydrological zones you have um, and therefore, and, and the combination of the combinations of those and the splitting area. And although uh, you can base those hydro hydrological zones on um, uh, the, the your estimate of you know geology which how much of the catchment is let's say clay or something um you know that you you may well as part of calibration then look to modify the proportions of those areas um to improve improve the model fit so um there's i suppose there's multiple steps in the process there um so overall that takes longer than when you're considering um a simpler model such as gl6j Okay, that's good to know. Um, got some more questions here. So if you can't see them, Tom, I can read them out to you. <laughs> um, someone from we've got Robert Brown. Uh, have you done any work on relating model parameters to catchment characteristics? Uh, sorry, I just did. Okay. Um, so uh, the short answer to that is no. We haven't been. We haven't at this stage been looking at uh, relating the model parameters to catchment characteristics. So we have started to get a, uh, we sort of have have a feel for um, what the parameters should be doing for different catchments, but it's not been part of a formal formal assessment at all. Okay, uh, we've got uh, going on. This, we've got Rob Tothill got his hand up. I'll unmute you, Rob, if you can ask your question. Thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, and thanks, Tom, as well. That was really interesting. Um, one thing I was wondering, you know, in the in the model, it's got a, the split between the two directions for the precipitation of 0.9 and 0.1. Yeah. Uh, have you got any opinion on that? Because it seems sort of maybe a bit strange that there's no variability in there in how, how that works. Um, yeah, so, so there's a, 
that's a fixed element in the model and actually there's the, I think also the um, the split between the two routing stores in GR6J is also uh, fixed. Um, I believe, and uh, uh, anyone else can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I, I believe that uh, they they found adding in additional functionality to to um, allow that to be a variable wasn't really adding significant performance. So a lot of fixing it was was um, uh, was simpler and um, didn't detract from from model performance. Okay, thank you. There is a paper um, which uh, by Push Palatha which describes the GR six J model and um, yeah, uh, yeah, that, that has that has more details. They looked at comparing uh, a range of different models that included more parameters as well, um, and so there's more there's more detail within that. Okay, thank you. Got, got a question from Miguel. Um, how were climate change projections applied to the model? Um, yes, that's a good question. So um, the the climate change projections were didn't did not form um, or derivation of those climate change projections didn't form a direct part of our work. So we were looking to apply um, climate change factors which were related to um, say the 2080s or the 2050s. And these were applied directly either to the stochastic um, flows or to, sorry, uh, stochastic rainfall and PT or to the uh, baseline rainfall and PT. Um, so 12 monthly factors um, for each and those were incorporated within, within, within the scripts. Um, we did, uh, also do some work to look at applying the um, RCM uh, climate change series. Um, so we um, basically compared the RCMs over a baseline period to the um, model uh, to the yeah to our ca catchment series um, to derive um, bias correction factors, which were then applied to the RCM data, and then the models were run from um, uh, from uh, 1980 through to 2080 to provide a basically a time series for each of the RCMs. Great. Uh, question here about where flows have been calibrated to reservoir drawdowns, has reservoir evaporation and seepage been considered? Um, so we, it, it depends um, on the reservoir we were looking at um, for some where we deemed it in, uh, important, we did incorporate reservoir evaporation within the assessment, but then others were not, partly because there was such uncertainty with um, some of the reservoir models. It was, uh, I think, by separating it out, it would give a, um, a, a bit of a, um, a false impression about the, the confidence with, with the overall assessment. So in a way the reservoir evaporation is then incorporated within the overall model calibration. Um, the other thing to say about that is there is a there is a computational consideration there. So um, it's in some cases we did look to um, derive um, separate evaporation and precipitation series that could then be used in the water resource, um, water resources model. In other cases, um, we didn't just to reduce the computational requirements for all the stochastic and climate change simulations down the line. Um, I've got a question from Ray. Is there a user manual available? That's a good readily, question. Readily available um, online. <laughs> I was wondering the same thing. <laughs> yeah, um, well, um, I think the two papers, uh, the one the one by Perrin uh, on GR4J and then the one by Push Palatha on GR6J um, is a, a good starting point. What I don't know is whether there is um, anything on the, 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 the model is available through uh, within R and there might be some additional materials on that, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'd need to check on that. Uh, got a question from Samantha. Um... How have you found the bespoke objective auto calibration function you've developed performs in comparison to GR6J's built-in auto calibration criterions? Um, so, I think the 
I don't know, um, Samantha, will you, will you, I don't, maybe you're referring to what might be available on the, the R library. Um, I'm, I'm not sure there, but um, we haven't been using, we, we've only been looking at the bespoke objective functions, that, the four that we've been, been using for this study. So we've not been making comparisons against any other um, uh, objective functions. We very much did this from from these are the things, these are the areas that we feel are important from a water resource perspective. So that, that comparison hasn't been made. Uh, we've got a question from uh, Mahid. I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. Um, so, and I, this is actually the question I was gonna ask as well, but you, um, you used a two year sort of warm up period um, for calibration um, and verification. What? So what was the reason, you know, what, what was the criteria you to decide that year? Why not? is it, mm. could, it could it be shorter? Because some models obviously are shorter than that. Why two years specifically? Yes, um, uh, two years was used as a, a pretty conservative um, uh, case, really. Um, we actually found that GR6J settles very quickly in most catchments, not not all, but, but most. So, um, uh, it, it can settle um, within a few months really um, quite nicely and and so for some some areas we've actually been providing series with a health warning on the very first few months right from the, the start of of the simulation um, but uh, so yeah the two years was very much a sort of worst case um, and we did look at at the time of deciding this, we did do comparisons against sort of looking at uh, changes in starting parameters and seeing uh, what impact that that had in terms of how long it took the model to to settle down. It is, I mean, it's a really important um, element of it because especially if you've got a drought within a year of your starting of your calibration, because you'd probably want to change your calibration and verification window to allow for that warm up. Warm -up. Uh, right, got a question. Well, Susanna, uh, I haven't seen the question. If you can, yeah, I'll unmute you or if, if you can ask your question. Not sure what the question is yet. Hello, thanks, Tom. Uh, sorry, I couldn't raise my hand. Um, <laughs> Uh, thanks, Tom. Really interesting presentation. I really like the fact that you point stressed that sometimes we need to ignore uh, poor performance performance metrics um, because of that is just not good. So um, my question is actually two, but they link to each other. Um, why did you feel uh, that there was a need to develop a Python version when there is a, a, the R version by the original developers of uh, GR6J? And, um, and then the other question is, if you know why does your Python version gives different results from uh, the R version from the French group that developed GR6J? Yep. Um, so on, on the reasons for developing a Python version, um, uh, at the time we were undertaking the work, I, I, did not, I don't believe the, the R version was available. It sin since is available. Um, but moreover, we um, we wanted to code it into Python for efficiencies in later uh, sim uh, simulation and to link it to our automatic optimization script, which is also in Python as well. That's, that's one reason. The other reason was we wanted to get that understanding of the model. And importantly, the, there are differences between the model that is published uh, in the paper and the representation of it and the model that's um, that's uploaded onto the R library. So there are slightly different implementations of GR6J out there. Um, and I, I don't, uh, I mean, given by, given the results that we have obtained with it, um, and we've based it off the paper itself, we are getting you know, confident in that, that model performance. But yes, it should be noted that there are, uh, the, the version available for the R library is different. Sorry, the, the other part of your question, can you just remind me of that? Uh, I think you answer. It was, it was uh, uh, well, if you know what are the differences between your implementation and the, the R implementation. Yeah, it relates, it relates to the difference in the uh, interchange function between the two routing stores. 
Um, so if you look at the schematic between the two paper and the version on the R library, there are differences in how that's represented. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's probably an area that um, would be uh, of interest to look into a bit more to see, you know, does that does that make a material difference on the model calibrations? I, you know, my my opinion is I don't think it does, but I think that would be would be of interest. Yeah. Thank you. Two more questions for you, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> we'll go through these quickly. We have got a few <laughs> minutes left. Um, question from Rob. Um, in catchment, it is sometimes necessary to change catchment area to maintain water balance. With the catchment interchange, do you find this unnecessary? Yes, um, that's not something I directly talked about, but it is uh, one of the advantages of GR6 days. We've found that we need to do much less. Well, the catchment area stay fixed throughout. So whatever the catchment area is from the GIS, that's that's what we've ended up using. Um, so short answer is um, we don't need to change that catchment area, which is which is good. Um, also, the other thing is. Uh, sometimes within these models there's the option to modify the input data and modify the rainfall PT and scale them so that option exists but our our, our feeling is from having uh, used GR6J we, we need to do that much less than um, other models uh, particularly in capacity like HiSIM um, so that the extent of the scaling of the input data is much reduced and, and in general we've, we've very much tried to not to do that because obviously that has implications down the line for um uh yeah, climate stochastic and climate change simulation if you've got these got these additional factors at play and um, last question uh, from ralph uh, when using your model calibration to run stochastic time series or climate change have they found any models where the exchange parameters x2 and x5 have become unstable and intended calibration behavior changed um yeah so so there is and i think that sort of goes back to um uh, my point on, on that uh one of the last slides about caution with those interchange functions which is related to the to the x2 and the x5 so i think sometimes when those parameters are quite extreme you can get um flow responses which do not um, appear natural so that that is an area to watch out for in the model calibration and something that needs to be um, uh, yeah needs to be looked at in respect of each catchment. I wouldn't say we found that in relation to the uh, stochastic and climate change um, simulations. Um, so and as part of this, we've been looking back at um, uh, 1976 as well to see how that performs as more more extreme more extreme than what we've got in our calibration validation period so, so uh, that has that has helped us in in getting that understanding um so i i i think that that we've not found that to be to be an issue but it is it is related to um what uh, what parameters you use for for those interchange for that interchange 